Thank you for coming to my talk. My name is Julia Hartig, and today I will be presenting on linear vibration and mixing in continuous spatial particle ALD. Particle ALD is typically performed in fluidized bed reactors, as shown here. We load our powder into the fluidized bed chamber. We then dose our precursors in an alternating fashion, separated by purge doses to remove any unreacted precursor or gaseous byproducts. And this process is repeated as many times as necessary to produce a film of the desired thickness. I'm showing here the binary sequence for alumina ALD, which is a very common coding chemistry in ALD, and also the chemistry I work with for my PhD. This is a temporal process, meaning that we space out the precursor doses in time. And this is also a batch process, meaning that we have no solids inflow or outflow during the ALD. The challenge is how do we deal with large volume production? This is typically done by increasing your system size, which results in higher costs and higher system footprint. You can also use deeper beds, but this comes with its own set of fluidization challenges, especially when working with very difficult to fluidize powders. So for high powder throughput, meaning 3,000 to 12,000 kilograms per day, we really need a continuous process. And this is where continuous spatial particle ALD comes into play. In contrast to batch temporal ALD, where we load our powder into the chamber, perform a series of reactions, and then remove that powder, we can remove some of this dwell time by continuously flowing powder through alternating regions of precursor gas. This way we can accomplish both half reactions simultaneously, just in different regions within the reactor itself. The continuous spatial particle ALD reactor we have at the University of Colorado looks as follows. Our particles enter on the left-hand side, these then pass over a porous base plate through which the gas flows. They first encounter a purge region, followed by our first precursor region, which is TMA here, another purge region, our second precursor region, and this unit, which corresponds to a single cycle of ALD, is repeated four times along the length of the reactor to complete four cycles of ALD before the particles drop out on the right-hand side. And these manifolds here dose gases into the reactor at velocities below fluidization. The particles themselves are conveyed through the bed using a process called vibratory convection. Essentially, we have this pneumatic vibrator here, which is just a self-reversing piston that oscillates the reactor bed, supported on a pair of leaf springs, and these oscillations induce net forward motion of the particles through the reactor. There are some aspects of the particle motion that are difficult to explore or investigate experimentally. So we developed a cohesive discrete element method model to provide some insight into the particle dynamics, in particular in two key areas. The first is to investigate the role of particle-particle and particle-wall cohesion. Typical studies on vibratory convection have focused on the convection of objects and the convection of coarse powders, where cohesion is often neglected. But in the case of particle ALD, where we deal with fine Geldart A and even ultra-fine Geldart C powders, cohesive forces play a significant role and cannot be neglected. And we're interested in the effects of these cohesive forces on the particle ALD process. We're also interested in what form of vibratory convection is occurring here. There are two dominant mechanisms discussed in the literature. The first is a hopping convection mechanism, where particles lift off of the frit during portions of the vibration. The second is a continuous contact convection mechanism, where particles slide forward more than they slide backward, leading to net forward motion. Continuous contact convection is more common under non-sinusoidal excitation, whereas hopping convection is more common under sinusoidal excitation. So we need some more information about the vibration waveform before we can determine which of these is occurring in continuous spatial particle ALD. We also need to make some simplifications. This reactor contains billions of particles, so we shrink our domain using a periodic box model. Essentially, instead of modeling all of the particles throughout the entire length of this reactor, we just look at a single periodic slice. This DEM model still requires information about reactor vibration, so an accelerometer was fitted to the top of the reactor to monitor reactor movement, and this data is then used as an input to the DEM model. And what we can see from the acceleration data is that the Y acceleration, which is along the primary flow direction, and the Z acceleration, which is in the direction of gravity, 
have some significant differences. And if we perform a fast Fourier transform on this acceleration data, we can reveal the key amplitude and frequency components as shown on the right hand side here. So another challenge is when we're talking about DEM modeling and inputs to DEM models, we really want a continuous function for this reactor motion. But this accelerometer data is discrete. So what we can do is we can choose the top three frequencies from this FFT decomposition and sum them together to rebuild the original accelerometer data as a continuous function for acceleration. So we will call this the FFT model. And you can see this fitting procedure in the figure I've shown is an example on the Y acceleration data. We see pretty good agreement between the model and the original signal. And if we integrate this once to get velocity and then twice to get position, we see that although the Y and Z accelerations were quite different, the Y and Z velocity and positions are fairly similar. And this is because the high frequency components that dominated the Z acceleration data actually drop out upon integration. And we also see that the reactor trajectory follows a profile that's somewhere between an ellipse and a line. So now we have a continuous function for reactor acceleration, velocity, and position that we can use as an input to our DEM model. And the way we decided to do this is to treat the Y data as a fluctuating wall Y velocity and the Z data as a fluctuating gravitational acceleration which avoids the computational complexities of actually physically having to move the mesh up and down in the Z direction. But before we can look at these results, we need to know what actually happens in the experimental setup. So we replaced the stainless steel upper chamber with an acrylic flow channel and dyed 50 micron glass particles to act as tracers in the flow. And by looking at these experimental results, we can see there's fairly good plug flow behavior under vibratory convection. We can also see that if we replace these acrylic walls with some stainless steel shim tape, which more accurately mimics the stainless steel upper chamber that we just replaced, we get even better plug flow behavior. So these results give us some context by which to evaluate our simulation results. And what we see is that the simulations also show plug flow behavior. And by slowing this down to about 10 times slower than real time, we can actually resolve the convection itself. So I'll play that one more time. And you can see that there are clear regions of liftoff where the particles separate from the frit and contact where they reconnect. We're also interested in quantifying mixing and I'll explain a little bit more why later in the presentation, but there's a few different ways to measure mixing. We chose to use diffusion coefficient as our measure of mixing here. Essentially what we do is we track the deviation of particle position around a trajectory defined by the bulk convection velocity. And what we find, which is perhaps unsurprising based on the videos you just saw, is that mixing is fairly slow and it's nearly isotropic. So these diffusion coefficients for self-diffusion are fairly low and we see that they're nearly equal in both the y and z directions. So you may wonder why worry about mixing in a monodisperse mixture? If we don't have size differences and we don't have density differences, why would we be concerned about something like self-diffusion? The reason for this is because when we're talking about a reacting system with gas solid reactions, poor top bottom mixing can have implications on coating uniformity. And I'm going to illustrate this using an optimization thought experiment. So again, the main advantage I would like to remind you of these continuous spatial particle ALD systems is the ability to achieve high throughput. And when we talk about high throughput, we're really talking about our mass flow rate or in this situation where I'm showing volumetric flow rate. And we're upper limited on how high we can drive some of these values. We need to stay below the fluidization velocity of our powder. And we also need have some limitations on packing fraction that limits our void fraction and our width of the plug is limited by the reactor geometry. So on the fly, the main parameter here that we can adjust is going to be our bed height. So when we talk about maximizing production, you may imagine that we really want to drive this bed height 
as deep as possible. But this isn't the only thing we're concerned about. We're also interested in ensuring good surface coating quality. And what can happen if you have a bed that's very deep and very gas diffusion limited is you can get concentration gradients in your system. And if you have poor top bottom mixing, these top layer particles will not see as high of a concentration of precursor as the bottom layer particles. And if your precursor zone isn't long enough, these top layer particles may not get to full coating surface titration. This contrasts to the idealized monolayer situation I'm showing on the bottom here, where all, all particles are seeing sufficient concentration or at least the same concentration of precursor. So you can imagine we're constantly playing this trade-off where we wanna run our beds as deep as we can to maximize production, but we don't wanna sacrifice our coating quality. So we asked ourselves, how do we guarantee equal exposure time without sacrificing throughput? In other words, can we induce convection currents without impeding net forward motion? Is there a way to improve this top bottom mixing that would allow us to use these deeper beds without having to worry about coating variability? And so we asked again if improvements can be made here. And when thinking about how to achieve this in the continuous spatial particle ALD system, we can take some lessons from powder mixers. We've got ribbon mixers, which I've shown on the left-hand side here. They're also rotating drums with baffles in them to induce mixing. We have V-blenders. We also have Kenix mixers, which have baffles in them to separate and recombine the flow. But in general, all of these different mixing techniques are unified by the same underlying principle, which is called the pastry maker technique. So essentially, in order to achieve a homogeneous mixture, you want to split, relayer, and repeat this process as many times as possible. So we want to keep this underlying principle in mind when thinking about modifications we can make to improve mixing in the continuous spatial particle ALD system. And what we decided to try was whether frit baffles can improve top bottom mixing. In other words, can we modify this frit geometry in order to induce convection currents that would enable us to use these deeper beds without having to worry about surface coating uniformity. So future work will investigate the role of this frit baffle geometry in mixing. In summary, we've developed a cohesive DEM model for continuous spatial particle ALD. Experiments and simulations revealed plug flow with hopping convection as the dominant mechanism, and frit baffles will be incorporated to improve top bottom mixing in future work. With that, I would like to thank the Weimar Research Group and the NSF Goalie proposal funding my work, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation.